So last night, man, we saw a scoring explosion. Not only Devin Booker dropped 60 some, but also Luca gave us 73 straight masterclass. As I reported yet last night, Luca gave us 73. Not too not not too many nights ago, Joel and B gave us 70. Giannis gave us 64. D Book gave us 62. Towns gave us 62. We are in the scoring era immaculate hoops right now before we get into any of the talking points i do want to make sure i watch every single last bucket from the brother luca because i'm gonna be honest with y'all it was my day off yesterday i didn't watch the first like two three quarters of, of luca i only watched a little bit of the fourth so i do i do want to see how this dialogue is going to happen so let's let's watch for a second mavericks in the off season here's luca and gets a shot at the bucket and lays it in in his fourth season. Lively on the handoff, and here's Luca again getting toward that restricted area. And you're right, Nick, he can't get that deep in the pit. That's such a big part of his offense and the Hawks' offense, his ability to create at the foul line. Luca for three. Get to Luca. Not gonna lie, the first two are kind of questionable, but that's a tough bucket right there. That's a tough bucket. On this play right here, when you step back, you're giving them too much room. It's the two free throws to pull Atlanta within four. Luca, oh boy! See again, you, you, you're giving him too much space. Keep that in mind. The way he started this week again. Oh, look at this! He faked everybody out of the way and said, "I might as well just go lay it in." It's too much dance. Luca doing it all. He's already 10 of 13 for the field. Well, make that 11 of 14. That's egregiously bad defense. I can't even hold you. That's that's bad defense. That's bad defense. <laughs> that then throw it. So, Luca, fade. He's not even hitting the rim. Luca, thirty. <laughs> All eyes on Luca Doncic. Uh oh. He gets a layup. 34 for Dantic. Luca, the point forward, gets a lay in. 39. The Mavericks without Derrick Jones Jr. for the rest of the night. He did sprain his left wrist on that offensive foul going for the dunk. And Luca, 6 of 3 to put his point total at 44. He's made a 3 in 54 consecutive games. Second longest active streak. Dames hit one in 119 straight. Luca, 96-88. He took, took the trap off again. Uh oh. Luca fires and hits. 55. My God, this is these are these are crazy hoops. I ain't gonna hold you. Five to tie Durant's arena record. Eight points for Onyeka. 108-105 Dallas. Luca puts it in. Will they give him continuation? No. Uh, but again. You're giving him a chance to have too much freedom. They gave him continuation. Oh, come on. Count the basket. Luca for 60. And that matches his own Maverick record for points in a game. Is Kobe's 81 in reach? Well, 70 for sure is. Step back. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. Knockout punch after knockout punch by Dodgich. The Hawks keep coming back. Luca. You know what? If they don't make an adjustment now, there's no way you're going to have a chance to win. A technical on Garrison Matthews. Scotty Barnes in Toronto coming in. Tickets available online at hawks.com slash tickets. 67. Lively. Picked up by Luca. In transition. Dantic drops it in. Count the basket. And a free. No, nah, they need. Yo, Luca's hooping. He was hooping. He was hooping. Minutes remaining in this game. Luca gets through the defenders. Powers up. Score. 72 for number 77. Madrid at age 16. 
drills it. Now, the reason why it was important to watch that because the conversation after Luka dropped the 73 was really about today's game and scoring in general, how it's changed in the game of basketball, and quite frankly, just defense all around. Should it be allowed for players to put up these type of numbers? Like I stated, uh, like I told you all before, not only did Luka get you 73 and B just scored 70 himself not too long ago, Ghana scored 64, Devin Booker scored 62, Towns scored 62 as well, and then shout out to the folks out in um, basketball reference. They put out a tweet saying that like this year, it's the most like 70 point games in the past two seasons of basketball, uh, implying that, you know, something is wrong, how there's so much scoring going on in the game. And this was not only heard through the ether, but also again, like on, on Twitter as well. Shout out to our brother, Jason Frank, where he said, these scoring explosions are cool, but the NBA existed for 76 years with 670 point games and now we've had four in one year it would be great if the rules slash officiating skewed back towards making it fair for defenses there's room to praise Luca and Bede Booker Dame and Mitch and the incredible offensive evolution and still want to see better two-way balance with officiating doesn't mean the people wanting defense to be a little easier dislike basketball defense is fun which I, I think is also I think that's a fair assessment I just want to be clear I think that's a fair assessment before we even go any further though I think he brought up a really really good point about you know defense and officiating but one more post is from Stephen A. Smith because Stephen A. Smith essentially claimed that he had he had his ears to the streets. He knows exactly what uh, the fans want. In all seriousness Long guys show. in all seriousness guys Mike let's not go overboard with this. The fans want this? No the league wanted it. The league well, wanted the it. League want? well, well, I just, they say it's because of the fans. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm saying the fans don't want guys getting mugged and no fouls getting caught. Right. Okay. But the fans didn't want what we saw last night in Atlanta. Did you see that? Are you sure? I mean, that was a layup. That was just listen. That was a it was like the All Star game. The, the Atlanta, the Atlanta Hawks. No wonder why y'all stink. Did you see how they played defense last night? They I mean, it. this is not. This is not Joel and B who played Billy Ball because you know what? You have a thin Victor Wimbignano on you. We understand that. We expect that. This is not a situation where Carl Anthony Towns dropped 58 in the first three quarters and then disappeared. It was an APB out for him in the fourth quarter and all of this other stuff. But the 58 points he scored in those first three quarters, a lot of those points, he was being challenged. This is not that. What transpired last night in Atlanta was disgraceful. It made me feel like, I, I mean, let's just go out and get somebody that don't want, you don't have to play defense? All you got to do is play offense. You don't have to play defense. That's what the hell took place in Atlanta last night. There's a difference. Don't tell me anybody wants that. No, you don't want to change it and go back to old times. But in the same breath, you don't mean for it to resemble the first three quarters at NBA All-Star Weekend, no, which is what last night looked like in Atlanta, Georgia. The Hawks, you should be ashamed of your damn self. You really should. Now, I want to be clear. There is, and after watching some of the clips from Luka, um, there's some validity behind what Stephen A. Smith said and a lot of validity what a lot of people have stated. It is undeniably true that the NBA has changed the rules to make it easier for offensive players to thrive and really flourish and put up crazy scoring numbers. Also, I think that defensively, the lack of effort is there as well. I think that's also a problem with many teams, especially when you have a defensive liability on the floor. But more importantly, though, I think it is very pertinent to acknowledge just where the game of basketball is at right now in terms of not even a skill standpoint because though I do believe that players are hi hyper skilled really just from a level of intelligence and then also how exactly do you combat that to say that there isn't any defense is a bit disingenuous when Luka just provides a lot of value outside of his ability to score and so when you're doubling Luka or when you're doubling players like Jokic it just makes it extremely difficult to contain them one way or another because if you do double them if you do attempt to contain them with multiple players then they're just going to score in other ways and it doesn't necessarily have to be with them it be with their teammates because they are great passers and so again and Luka gets double, gets a, a good look, because so, now you're guarding, uh, have a guard put some type of presence on a forward. And so, again, this is where the intelligence just comes from. Luka is getting picked up basically at the half-court line right now, and he's getting doubled. He's getting shown two players. And so there is no more rim protection because your two biggest players are trying to pick up Luka 
And now that's an easy look for them because a guard is trying to rim protect. Half court set, you set a screen. Now the big is outside of the lane trying to defend the perimeter, which then leaves a smaller player trying to guard Derek Lively, one of the best lob threats in the NBA. Again, pick and roll action. We're picking at Trey Young because Trey Young is a defensive liability. That's what we're going to do. You have to send double, and now you're playing four on five action. That's what happens when you double. Luka coming off of a dribble handoff gets doubled. DeJounte Murray and Clint Capella are defending Luka. Like, what do you like? What do you do with that? So if you know Luka has the ability, and, and, and what people need to understand is this, even when players like Tim Hardaway miss shots like this, because Tim Hardaway does go on to miss a shot, but even when they go on to miss the shot like this, it conditions the defense to know that that is always available. It don't matter how we defend this man, he can always find the open player. That will always be available to him, so there's always going to be a quality look. That's what I see. I see it to where offensive players, are finally being surrounded with more offensively capable help, which then makes it more difficult to defend the initial offensive player. Better spacing, better pacing. It's understood to allow the best offensive player on your team to handle the ball more, to structure the offense around them, and you're going to have results like this. Sprinkle in more three-point shooting. Sprinkle in the fact that because there's more three-point shooting, the type of big men that existed back in the day cannot play in today's league because the Kembe Matumba would be a liability on the floor if he tried to defend Jokic, if he tried to defend Luka, if he tried to defend, defend Curry, if he tried to defend Shea, they would be probing him all the time. Our good friends in the Gilbert Arenas also said something about this. Yeah, you're seeing so many different sets being run uh, for oh, the skill level in this league is insane. And, and, and actually the coaching, the schemes on offense is insane. You're seeing so many different sets being run uh, for bigs to get threes. I mean, coaches are being way more creative to put their best players in, in, in great positions to get those numbers and you got shooters all around the floor you got penetrators i mean this is the peak of basketball in my opinion you're seeing it with guys doing i mean come on man our bigs we got bigs in the league getting 70 and 60 making nine ten threes shooting pull up jump shot i mean it's insane what we got going on Katie's right. I, and in particular with the coaching aspects, if you go back and watch a lot of coaching that happened in the 90s and early 2000s, a lot of players were handicapped on what they could or couldn't do just solely off of coaching alone. Coaching has really developed and opened us up to think outside the box and allow players to do what they want to do. It's similar to how we saw in the 60s where the level of innovation pushed the game forward within a rapid point of time, within like a five to seven year period between the 50s and 60s, the game developed so quickly because there was no blueprint to handle handcuffing players and how they played back in. So then you had players like Elgin Baylor, who's running around handling the ball and leading his team and rebounding, or the same thing goes with um, Oscar Robertson. And you had um, players like Will Chamberlain dominating the game so much that you had to open up the lane. Uh, you know, I think the open-mindedness has really changed the game of basketball as well. I wholeheartedly agree with KD with that. And, and to be fair, this is just how basketball works. This is how life works, right? When you have a level of innovation that's going to push things forward, it's always going to need some level of correction. The reason why we have a shot Shot clock in today's game because George Mikan was so dominant that teams decided, hey, we're going to get a six to eight point lead and we're just going to just play hot potato for the rest of possession because we can't do so. Because we know for a fact if Mikan gets the ball back in his hands, he's going to dominate us. It's the reason why they opened up the lane because Wilt Chamberlain was so dominant. It's the reason why when you shoot free throws, you can't cross the free throw line until the ball hits the rim because they thought that Wilt Chamberlain could genuinely jump from the free throw line and catch the ball and dunk it. It's the reason why the rule are set in place today because of innovation. We've allowed players to push the game forward. But what happened in, in the 90s and the 2000s and even the late 80s as well is that the innovation stopped and we started to criticize players way more often for how they play. So if you're a point guard, you have to play a certain type of way. Jerry West didn't play that way. Oscar Robertson didn't play that way. Tiny Archibald didn't play that way. So now you have players who, in all honesty, if Gilbert Arenas played in today's game, he would be able to do the shit that y'all seeing. Steve Nash himself openly admitted he could have scored more. He probably should have scored more. But at the time, no one was really pushing that type of concept yet. So you had a whole subsection of guards that were handicapped because if you score too much, you were viewed as you, you selfish. That's all you were. You're just selfish. Same thing goes for bigs. If you're a big, you have to play a certain type of way. You got to be a post player. You got you to gotta score inside. So now there's no three-point shooting. Now there's no floor, no floor spacing. In the 90s, that was okay because you could still get some type of floor spacing by manipulating illegal defense by putting 
having non-floor spacers at the top of the key. But then when they allowed zone defense, now you got a whole bunch of non-floor spaces on the floor with zone defense. So now that 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 handicaps the offense even further. But as time progressed, what we realized is, hey, that power forward playing next to that center, he needs to be shooting threes because the, the mid-range shooting and the post-up plays that he is giving us isn't valuable enough. So then the Ryan Andersons, the Rashard Lewises, he do Turkaloos, they come into the game. Then what ends up happening is, hey, we need even more floor spacing so that power forward can then get pushed down to the center position. The LaMarcus Aldridge's, the Chris Bosh, they get pushed down to the five. Hey, if we can't find a Ryan Anderson, we'll just play a little bit smaller and put small forwards down to the power forward position. Especially because the Ryan Anderson's, the Hidu Turkaloos, they're so defensively inept that now the pick and roll that's happening we can just pick at those players all the time. So now it actually benefits us to put a small forward at the at the power forward position because there's so much pick and roll happening that we can switch. Oh, if you're going to switch the power forward, now I'm going to pick at the center. And at a center, DeAndre Jordan is sagging off way too low when Curry's coming off a pick and roll. So now we're still giving up too much offense. So now we're going to play even smaller. And it was nothing but a recipe for where we are today, where everybody's trying to catch up to all of the, the innovation and the evolution of offense to where now, Here's a bunch of 6'6 six, six to 6'8 six, players who are on the floor playing heavy minutes because those players can provide the value offensively while not being defensive liabilities. At some point, it's going to get to a point where if you are like 6'3 and shorter, you might not have space in this air in this league, especially when there's more players like Anthony Davis, Giannis, Chet, Wimby playing in the league where they can basically just do anything. But it's just evolution. So you think it's a good thing like, that the bigs are doing that shit? It's going to get three. Well, but yeah, it's right at this point right now. There's a you can't guard me. It's going. Can't guard me. So is it still on the uptick? Yeah, I'm, here we go with Still, that. When I say AD, the reason why I'm saying AD is because Anthony Davis is a big that can defend multiple different positions. So AD can still play big at 6'10", 6'11", while also not giving up anything on the perimeter as well. He can switch on the perimeter. Maybe plateau. Maybe plateau is a better word. Think, I mean, because how many more positions can go because shooters? The center, I, I think center where is the last no, position. I think where it's going now is there will be no more small point guards. No point guard. I told you! Oh, Kenny and his spitting dog! Oh my God! He immediately said it. There will be no more small point guards. Your point guard is going to have to be six five, six six. Mm -hmm. Yes. Your shooting guard is Paul George and Kevin Durant. Yes. Your small forward is Paul George, Kevin Durant, <laughs> and Wimby. Mm -hmm. Four man is Paul George, Kevin Durant, <laughs> Wimby, Chet. Your five man is Embiid, Jokic, Chet, Chet, Wimby. Wimby. <laughs> This is just this is this is what this is the new you go out your skill set like big now and B gonna have to like he's proven where you can be a certain weight and certain size and still have the handle and all that. Facts. Yo, Kenyon said the exact oh shout out to Kenyon Martin. Because I do believe that's where the league is gonna go. Where the skill set from certain positions is gonna be asked to do so much so the benefits that you receive from smaller players can really be seen everywhere else. But the liabilities that you see from a some smaller player is something that you don't want. And so when you go back and you go rewatch how Luca's scoring, there's times where he's picking at Trey Young because Trey Young is too small on the floor. And there's times where he's picking at Clint Capella because Clint Capella is too slow. So the small guard that has been in the league for a while now the league is getting to the point where they're not if they're physically unable to be on the floor because like what are you going to do you're going to stop six seven six eight ball handlers this is why last year i said bro lebron when lebron came into the league when you had that stretch where really it was post mj when mj had provided the evidence that your best player can be a six six wing and he can handle the ball initiate offense score at a high rate and then they allow grant hill to do that and they allow Tracy McGrady and Kobe do that and then LeBron came in and he showed you that not only could you do the scoring but also you can do the passing as well Penny Hardaway is another example so now we're getting to the point where you have bigger players who understand that they can be the offensive hub and coaches are not going to sit here and say the point guard does this the shooting guard does this small forward does this power four centers you all stay here they're not doing that no more and so because they are uh, coaches are open-minded enough to accept the fact that I'm going to allow this player to play whatever brand of basketball they're best at and then build around that, that allows everything to be much more open and free-flowing. 
But in, in other eras of basketball, it really wasn't the fact that many of those players weren't skilled enough. It was that the coaches were handicapping them. The coaches would never allow guards to score as much as they did. They would never allow. If people who watched the Lakers growing up, bro, if y'all really thought that that's who Lamar Odom was, you have no idea. Lamar Odom was way better than what the numbers actually showed you in his in his style of play because his skill set would allow him to bring the ball up, do crazy shit, but they wouldn't allow that to happen in the NBA. So it's it's a plethora of a lot of things. I do think that rules need to be changed to readjust to where we once were because we're getting to the point where scoring is so ridiculous right now that it's it's like we're scoring at a historic rate and some of it is a bit boring. Some of it is you lose the you lose that 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 feeling of what a 70 point game means or what a 60 or a 50 point game means because it happens so often and to that you have to adjust that's and that's that's life in general innovation pushes the game forward to adjust it to make sure things don't get too out of hand you set rules in place that's the reason why they allow zone defense because so many teams were manipulating illegal defense and just backing up you got to set the rules in place but what people what we have to acknowledge is that the way we get here first is because of in innovation is because of skill is because of some level of development and open-mindedness with style of play we have to acknowledge that first